All right, looks good. On uh, three, two, one. We are speaking uh, with the one and only uh, Mark Mangol of American Tears. The new album is Free Angel Express. And and it's not often we get to do this, but we're also speaking to uh, Mark of Touch. The new album is Tomorrow Never Comes. Look at that. It is a double-double, wow. and being in Canada with uh, Tim Hortons, uh, double-doubles are how we uh, how we roll in this part of the world. But uh, bonjour, monsieur. How are you? Bonjour. I'm very good. Very good. I'm in, in Stockholm, actually. Yeah. Uh, been holed up here for a while, hoping to get back to the U.S. as soon as possible. So, it should be soon, actually. So. Yeah, so l- let us get started with American Tears. Here, here's a band that has had a long, long history, going all the way back to the early 70s. Uh, talk to me about here we are in 2021, uh, putting together a new album. Does does Deco Music come to you and say, hey, we really love this stuff? Let's no, I can stop you right there. No, okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, well, over the last three years, we've done three American Tears records. Um, the first one uh, called Hardcore. That's right. I came out in Japan. Well, it, it's been out in the U.S. Um, ended up on Escape in Europe, but that was done pretty much in isolation as a labor of love and a and a labor of insanity. I would say. <laughs> a moment, a lost moment of just really wanting to return to that feeling of Prague in the 70s and playing a synth solo and playing a Hammond organ solo and um, not being constrained by formula and all this generic rock, melodic rock and all these labels that are out there. So I launched on that. And then the following year, I did uh, another album, White Flags, which brought in some other musicians, Alex Landenberg, uh, and now Free Angel Express is with Alex Landenberg uh, and Barry Sparks on bass. You might know those guys. I know Barry. He was uh, with the Bees. He was with Dawkin and, of course, Michael Schenker. You got to love Barry. Absolutely. I do love Barry. He's just, you know, the best. So um, he played on some stuff and, and Alex is with Camelot and the band called Syrah and, you know, a whole bunch of stuff, just consummate musicians, which is really what American tears is about. No guitar player. We never had a guitar player. Um, well, on the third, it's complicated. On the third record in the seventies, we added a guitar player and morphed into a band called touch, but that's another story. So it was refreshing to get back into that open, uh, kind of music where you're not, you don't have the safety net of formula. Um, if you want to not go to the chorus and go into a three minute synth solo, organ solo, you do that and you do it until you get bored. And these days you get bored a little faster than maybe in the seventies where everybody was smoking pot, you know? <laughs> yes. So the, and didn't the have whole- Twitter and, 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 and socials to distract them. And you didn't have a thing called a soundbite. So people had some, you know, amount of patience to, uh, including myself, to maybe, you know, listen to something for a while. But the patience level has really changed in all these years. So, yeah, so we did three American Tears records and the new one out right now is um, Free Angel Express, which, um, yeah, very committed to that kind of crusade and um, seems to be getting some very nice response. So very gratifying. Let me, let me just quickly ask you about about the songs on uh, Free Angel Express, because I, I look at the times. You've got eight minutes, ten minutes, six minutes, uh, six minutes. You know, they're, they're longer songs. Um, you know, radio has always been give me two and a half minutes, three minutes. Uh, talk to me about constructing a song. How, how does it how does a song get to be 10 minutes uh, in, in a sense? Where do you sort of find that cutoff point where you say, all right, now it's time to end this. Uh, why not make sort of three minute singles, uh, which, which, you know, you know, get to the chorus, don't bore us kind of a uh, thing. That's a I, good expression. Uh, I do. I have done I, that. I stole it from Paul Stanley, by the way. <laughs> I have done that. Um, when you think about good vibrations by the beach boys, that song is like, a symphony and like it's like how did they do that but really it's in instinct some sort of cosmic feeling of i'm just bored with that now 
And when that happens, you come up with something that is of interest. And of course, I'm the first judge of that. So if I'm getting bored, I'm going to try to come up with something that um, is a shock or interest or creates a moment or changes a tempo or does something that keeps my attention. Or, and that's really, you know, that's really the criteria. It has nothing to do with radio or these age old, you know, formulas of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, fade. No, it, it's really on a, on a bigger level. And that's kind of what it was in the 70s and 60s. I mean, with Yes and Jethro Tull and Jimi Hendrix and everybody, you know, Led Zeppelin. I don't have to name the bands. We know the bands. Um, we know all these great bands. Uh, it's been, yeah, just... and that's this music was born with that mentality. And I don't know, at one point it got a name. I mean, Yes used to be pop, and now then it became prog, and now it's, I guess, the definition of prog in a way. Uh, but all these titles didn't really exist. We were just trying to find a sound. Um, when we were working on American Tears, we had these synths. I had these an organ, a Mellotron. When the ARP strings was invented, I started using that. And then, you know, when things got invented, we started using them because ARP Odyssey and Minimoog were monophonic. You had one note. So when they came out with some polyphonic shit, it was like, oh my God, it's polyphonic. We could play two notes. We, we could play two notes. And by the way, you're right. You're right about the labels because growing up uh, in the '70s and '80s, you turned on the radio and one moment you're listening to Detroit Rock City, and then you're listening to Eddie Rabbit, uh, you know, another rainy night, and then you're listening to the Cars wow, and Eddie it, Rabbit. Yeah, I know. I'm going deep here, down down the rabbit hole, but. Um, it's just amazing. And then somewhere around the end of the ni or end of the 80s, early 90s, they said, oh, no, 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 this is AOR. Oh, no, 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 this is melodic. Rock. Oh, no, 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 this is grunge. And it's just like, what are these labels? Uh, what happened to the good old days? If you turn on the radio and you heard nine to five followed by, you know, schools out. And anyway, we, we lost that. Um, well, I think American Tears, it depends on the song. I mean, you know, Free Angel Express, the song is basically a suite with three pieces in it. The first is an instrumental then the song called Resist, which is about as anti-Trump as you could possibly get. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, actually, it's anti-anything that you, you can you know, put in your name, depending on your belief system. And then it kind of gets bluesy and soulful. So, uh, And there's some other songs that are pretty straightforward. You know, they're not, I wouldn't call them prog. I just would call them, you know, they're played with keyboards. And if you hear synthesizer solos, suddenly that becomes... Uh, revolutionary in a way though they're starting to use synth on pop more um you know i think justin bieber just had a song with actually kind of a synth solo so i was like wow that's nice and people are coming up to me going how did you get that sound out of the guitar it's like it's not a guitar it's a synthesizer the good synth. Uh, so it, hey. it's funny um, before I get into songwriting, and I do want to, I do want to touch on that. Uh, the band comes out of New York in the '70s. What was that scene like with Max's Kansas City and CBGBs and the New York Dolls and Kiss and 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 you know the Good Rats and all, just what was that like? Was was it competitive? Was it friendly? Were were you a brotherhood? Were you like those motherfucker? You know, sorry, sorry, we got to beat them. It, it was a beautiful brotherhood and a time to be around. And uh, it just, you don't find it anymore. One of the reasons I originally came to Stockholm is because there is a music scene, a great music scene here that yep. in a way was a little similar to what New York was. There was a club in, I'm talking fast because I, I, well, I can talk slower if you want. Um, no, China Club. Um, Nirvana. Every Thursday in Nirvana, there was a jam. And Everybody would be there from David Bowie to the Stones to Michael Bolton would come up and sing a song. Uh, that's how I met uh, Michael Bolton, actually, and Aldo. Uh, was he Aldo. still Michael Bolton at the time? I forget. And another <laughs> club called, called China Club, he was just making the transition, and we wrote a song called Fool's Game uh, after meeting at the China Club, actually. So there was a a very integrated scene. Uh, and you could go down and you could meet people that could 
create a career for the next five years, which is kind of, you know, what happened. Um, so it, it was very vibrant and accepting and accessible and fun. Uh, and everybody was kind of doing their thing and trying to come up with their thing. So it was, it was a wonderful time in New York at that time. It, it, it must have been just an absolute great scene, uh, you know, with the Twisted Sisters there and the, the, the dolls. Um, yeah. They were more on Long Island. Uh, True. I, I actually lived on Long Island near a place called the Action House, which was where the Vanilla Fudge came up. The Rascals would play there almost every week. Uh, Billy Joel, you know, who wasn't quite Billy Joel yet, would play there. Who else? Uh, the, I don't know if you know the Vagrants and Lee Michaels. It was a big Hammond place. Um, and that's one of the reasons I was really in the center of the Hammond thing, because that's when I got my Hammond C3 and I was in a band called The Gathering Storm, which morphed into a band called Valhalla, which pretty quickly got a deal because you could be playing at a club and you could get a call the next day that some A&R guy saw you and do you want a record deal? It was quite different. Yeah, it's not like today. Now you got to scratch and claw. Uh, it, that's, let me get into the, to the songwriting. You wrote, of course, with Michael Bolton. You've written with Aldo Nova. Uh, talk to me about that, because you look at Touch, you look at uh, American, um, you know, they're, they're different kinds of songs. How do you approach the songwriting when you're sitting down and writing for the more pop base, you know, when, when it's going out to Cher, when it's going out to Laura Branigan? Uh, how do you approach that kind of songwriting? Um, well, it's a language. And, you know, you just speak another language. It's like, I would ask you if you were interviewing Frank Zappa or Celine Dion, you know, how do you do that? Well, you, that's what you do, man. So it's kind of, you know, in a way what I do, some of it I do better than other things. Um, but with Michael, you're sitting there with that energy and that voice. And when, in general, when you're sitting with the singer, it is so much easier because a, you know, if they're going to resonate with it. B, you hear it come back at you immediately as opposed to trying to sing it or maybe you hire some demo singer to sing it and try to imagine it being done by whoever. So um, it really helps. But you just kind of put on another hat and gravitate. And it's nice to stretch and get out of your maybe comfort zone. Um and it just happens, and that's what creativity is about. I mean, Benny Mardonis were some of the most fun sessions I've had because with Benny, we'd write, and my face would hurt because he would have me laughing literally for three days, and we wrote a lot of stuff. Um, and we wrote a song called um, For a Little Ride, which one of my favorite singers, Paul Rogers, eventually sang. So, so you know, some good stuff happened, but the energy is different with everybody who you write with, and... Um, you're just kind of there and being trying to bring something to it. And sometimes you're channeling from some other dimension in a way. Uh, it's just a creative moment, I would say. It is. So let me ask you, has things have things changed for songwriters now in, in the current context? Because in the old days, you would you would get a, a credit on a record and, and eventually you'd get a, a check in the mail. Now with Spotify, which is from Sweden, and all this other streaming stuff, it, can you still have a career as a songwriter, or have they sort of devalued the profession? Yeah, it's definitely devalued. I would say the money is much, much less, unless you're in the super pop world. You know, if you're getting covers by the top 20 artists, you know, those people I, I think are doing well, but... Um, you know, you, you read the articles about people getting many, many streams yeah. or whatever. Well, I, I mean, I spoke Spotify to uh, Desmond and Child, and he's much. like, I had a billion yeah. streams, and I got 5,000 bucks. And you're like, oh, okay. Well, you know, the way I think about it is if you had a song played on a New York station, radio station, it's going to go out to a million people. So what is streaming? You know, streaming is kind of radio. So if it sounds like a lot you know, that you've got, oh, a million streams, but basically you had a song played on the radio and a mil million people heard it. So, and when that happened um, in the old days, you'd get, I think, get two cents per play or three cents per play or something like that. So it is 
maybe a little, you know, in, in line, maybe less in line. Um, but yeah, it's, it's yeah, you, it's, you know, I never thought of that. I mean? But when you're driving around New York City, and the song's going out on whatever uh, Q104, there's a million people that might listen to it, but you're not getting right. paid for the million listens, you're getting paid for the one play. Yeah, you're getting paid for the one play. And also, hopefully, they will sell some CDs from that one play or, or some LPs or whatever, whatever it is. Hopefully merch. And yeah, all that stuff. So let me ask you. Uh, but it's hard. It's hard because what's popular now is very protected, very insulated. So if you're getting a hit, you know, hit with Justin Bieber, Demi Lovato or Cardi B though, or, or Katy Perry, those industries in themselves are you can't very hard to get in there. It is. And and yeah. those guys are, are now eight to ten songwriters per track. And it's just like, oh, my God. Um, yeah. We, we uh, Before we started recording, we spoke about Aldo Nova. Aldo lives literally 20 minutes from me. I was at his house in August. Um, talk to me about writing with him. Were, were you writing for Celine Dion? Were you writing for John Bon Jovi? Were you writing for something else? What were those sessions like? And, and what were you working on? We actually were working on some Drive She Said songs. Uh, this band I was in with a, a great singer, Al, Al Fritsch. And uh, I think one time Al and I went up and uh, we wrote two songs that ended up on our first record. I think um, wrote a bunch of stuff. And uh, we love Aldo. It, it was it was also it's very interesting writing with Aldo. So that was fun. We had yeah, a good time. He he has his uh, his way, and I mean, listen, you you can't deny that he's had success with the Bon Jovi stuff and the Celine Dion stuff, and of course, fantasy and all that stuff. Uh, yeah. I think I forget if we met actually at the China Club. I, I think we did. We met at the China Club, and it just evolved into, "Hey, man, come up to Montreal." It's like sure, and that was it was a lot of fun. It's a it's a great city. It's a great city, and I got to hold his Grammy. That's all I care about. <laughs> uh, Tomorrow never comes. The new Touch album comes out at the end of March. Uh, talk to me about that. It's been it's been a long time since uh, since you've touched touch. Um, that's that's going to be, by the way, the uh, the new uh, selling point. A long time since you touched touch. Uh, since, we, since we since we touched each other. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So well, we actually, with COVID, have not touched each other yet. <laughs> and what's... I don't know that we ever will. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a long time. But but talk to me about that. How how is that different from American Tears? How do you go? Okay, these songs go in pile A. These songs go in pile B. And these songs I send to other people to sing. How, how do you sort of? separate these piles and not just have you know mark here's mark stuff you know solo stuff how do you how do you differentiate the three bands or the the three piles um uh, how you you just have a sense of what is appropriate for something else i i mean you know, i talked before about having someone's voice in your head i mean craig's voice you know the pretty much the main singer of touch though we all sing lead and on this record we're all sending lead and we do a lot of trade-offs and blood but his song is is forever seared into my brain so if i'm thinking of something oh i kind of hear his, his his voice in there but the touch stuff is definitely more normal i would say than american tears uh we have a very prog song called swan song on, on the record, which is, I think, eight or nine minutes. Um, and I'm just so gratified that people are really responding to it in, in a wonderful way. But it has guitars. It has thousands of background vocals. That's kind of the thing about Touch is we um, try to be pretentious and large as in life <laughs> as much as possible. And, uh, you know, it's got synth, synth solos and guitars playing note for note with synth solos and we rarely have a guitar solo without a, a synth either symphony or synth solo right after it so hey, well, let me stop you there for a second why has the keyboards and the synthesizers taken such prominence in your music because you look at the old days or you look at some of you know we have we talk about guitar heroes we talk about you know that thing why not more guitars why, why not get a, a a shredder in your band well i don't play guitar so my, my line, you know, my language is, is keyboards. Um, and we do have, you know, if you 
listen to the record, there's some heavy guitar stuff on it. Very heavy guitar. Maybe more heavier than we've ever been. Uh, though Touch is a very eclectic band. And I do think Craig is pretty much skating on this stuff. He's always had melody and speed. Uh, and of course, he sings his ass off. He's singing better than he ever has in his life. He's singing high G sharps, high A's, in addition to his the rest of his range. He hasn't he hasn't blown himself out over the years. Uh, and I, I say everybody's playing better than they, they ever were. Um, but yeah, we kind of try to mix it. It's like one of my favorite bands is Deep Purple. You know, and, and you know, Richie really did a guitar solo unless John did a keyboard solo either before or after. So we have a similar mentality, but where I go with my, what I do is I, I build tapestries because I love these animals, these combinations that you build, not just, for instance, with a Hammond organ, but then you put a Melchon over it and you put a synth over it. And then maybe you put some piano stabs in there and just something to get the hairs in your arms to raise or go, what the fuck is that? How did, how, how did that happen? It's, it's kind of in a way, um, symphonic or orchestral, though it's not consciously that, um, but I just love piling up these animals and making these lush things. And you put some, 60 tracks of background vocals in there, create some odds or something, as we did on almost all of the songs. And it becomes a very signature thing. And that, that was kind of the crusade of touch. And that's why we changed the name on the, the last American Tears record was because, okay, this is no longer American Tears. It has nothing to do with, you know, a keyboard trio. This is not one guy singing with no harmonies because the other guys in American Tears did not sing. This is... Um, lush and its harmonies and, and doug has a great lead voice i sing lead on a bunch of the songs so um it's a different animal it is uh and then we'll uh... and, and let me let me just add there were discussions about what is touch in the band i mean sometimes it was like you know pulling teeth but the conclusion was and if you hear the record you'll hear a lot of different kind of directions. The conclusion was this is a, a vehicle for us to be expressive. And we're going to, you know, do what we do. And we're going to try to be as true to it as possible and bring, we kind of become a slave to whoever wrote the song in, in a way. And we try to make it as good as we possibly can for that person. So there's a lot of loyalty kind of and a certain point, like Scream at the Sky, for instance, um, which Craig wrote, it's almost started off to be kind of Pink Floydy or something. But then we brought our thing to it, and then it just morphed into something else. And we, we have some just kick-ass rockers on it. And um, we just, I mean, Doug's song, Tripping Over Shadows, you know, people are comparing to Foreigner and, and whatever, White Snake, the ballads. It's like, Gotta love Foreigner uh, and Whitesnake, I can tell you that much. <laughs> yeah, so that wasn't our intention. It's just, it was a rock ballad, and we just brought what we do to it, and I think we made it very true to the song in our own way. But I, I think it kind of goes through that filter um, and ends up being as good as that, as good as we could do it, I would say. Yeah. So we are, again, kind of eclectic. Classic band, uh, Free Angel Express, of course, is is available now, and 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 I'll end on this. In terms of the recording process, because you talked about sixty backing vocals and all that, are, are, do you like are, are the new technology with the Pro Tools and all kinds of stuff, or are you more old school where just four guys get in the studio, turn on the turn on the mic and record? What's your preference for putting together music? Well, you, right now you have no choice. Of course, I love being in the room together. We used to love being in the studio, um, especially with a great engineer, great producer. Um, we did have to learn, as everybody does these days, how to do it ourselves. I mean, can you see the studio behind me? I do. Uh, I can. It looks good. Yeah. I mean, that's where I, I mix it. The, we started out in, in um, New York City. We had some sessions in March of two, 2020. And then it hit. And then everybody went to their respective places, Chicago, Connecticut, and uh, New Jersey, and I was, I was in Sweden. I became went to Sweden quickly, uh, and kind of locked, got locked in here. But then we started doing it long distance, and Craig taught himself how to use this program called Logic, which is a music program, as did Doug. So they started 
we started FaceTiming, we started creating tracks alone in solitude, you know, in conjunction with each other. And everybody got pretty darn good at it, at, at getting the sound. I gave Craig a mic. This is a beautiful Neumann mic. I don't know if you can see it. That's a world-class mic. So if you can get a vocal on that mic, it's going to be competitive because many great records have been done on these kind of mics. So it is possible to do it. And um, it's definitely not as fun. It, it's kind of lonely. And um, it is quite an accomplishment. On the other hand, um, the pandemic, I think, has caused a lot of people to creative people to be creative. Um, it's given them time to go inside and there's a lot of records coming out. Yeah, there, there uh, are. 2021 you know, and 2022 is going to be filled with great releases. I mean, I've got like five just this month. To fucking do. I <laughs> mean, you know, you can't be on tour. You can't be playing it for, so it, it, you know, unless you're going to, you know, get a bottle of vodka and drink for nine months. You uh, or maybe you do that and you and you tour. And, and by the way, same goes for me. I mean, I, I'm doing four interviews today and I did three yesterday. I, I there's nothing exactly. else to do except to sit here <laughs> and talk to people. But you know. is that why you're not shaved? I, I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, no, I don't. I, I gave up on the shaving, I, I do it once I, a week now. I, sh yeah, I shaved this morning for you, so you know, it's like. I should have shaved too, but no, listen, I, I'm down to shaving as soon as it starts itching too much. It's just like, there's no point. Nobody's going to see me. I mean, I literally. My, my face starts to just, you know, yeah. go down. It's just. But I, I mean, uh, coming up on March 13th, I'll have been locked in this house for a year. So. I'm not wearing pants right now. So, yeah. you know. Uh, neither am I. Who needs them? <laughs> exactly. You should see what's going on under here. No. Uh, <laughs> anyway, there you go, Mark. Uh, great pleasure, by the way. And uh, Free Angel Express, folks, uh, go check that out. Uh, thank you, as we say, or merci as we say in Montreal. Merci. Merci bien. Are you French as well? Or? I, I do both, of course, with a name oh, like so Lafon. And oh. you live in Quebec. So. Oh, I wasn't pronouncing it that way. I was pronouncing Lafon. Well, so. I, I, I do say Mitch Lafon, but uh, in French, I do Lafon. say Mitch Lafon. So I, I oh, go, I, it goes both ways. But, uh, you know. Very cool, very cool. Anyway, it was wonderful. And mm, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We got it done. Yeah, man. Merci bien. Cool. Stay